I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. This has been a week of introspection, concern, confusion, and in a moment we'll talk with New York Times Nobel Prize winning columnist Paul Krugman, who's literally and figuratively been on the money with his insights. Then This Land columnist Dan Barry joins us. The best and the best of his extraordinary columns have been brought together for his latest book, appropriately called This Land, America Lost and Found. My Times colleagues discuss the week's lead stories on the backstory, and I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. But first, New York Times op-ed columnist and distinguished professor of economics here at the CUNY Graduate Center, Paul Krugman. Paul, you've written recently that uh, there isn't probably going to be one big bubble bursting, probably a lot of little bubbles. But the question is when? That's the question everybody wants to know. Everyone assumes there is some bubble or little bubbles out there, but when is this going to happen? Okay, well, you know, that's never a question anybody's ever to an able to answer really well. Um, I would put it this way, I would de I don't think it's going to happen this year. No, it's not very little of this year. I don't think it's, we're going to see it in the next six months. Uh, um, but it would be really surprising if we went as, as much as, as four years without something. I mean, we just have accumulation of, as I said in, in the, the little rather technical piece I wrote this up in, um, there's no one huge thing. There's no one giant thing like the housing bubble, which was kind of an obvious, there's nothing that looks like that out there. But there's a bunch of smaller things, kind of a, I'm calling it a smorgasbord of, of, of trouble. And sooner or later, they're going to, things will go wrong. There looks like, there's a kind of a general psychology that because we've had this long period of pretty steady growth, all the way back to 2010 now, um, people, are, as usual, have forgotten about risk. People are getting careless. The lending is getting careless. And we're starting to see everything from trouble in, uh, in fracking to uh, trouble in Turkey starting to crop up. And it's building. The, 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 uh, a, a moderate recession has got to happen sooner or later. So this is probably an unfair or maybe even indiscreet question, but if you came into $100,000 right now, where would you put it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I actually do have some, you know, I have to make investment choices. You know, that, I don't know anything well enough. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing obvious to short and there's no obvious. Uh, so diversify, um, you know, the, it, the bond market, at least, is acting as if it has the same view. I mean, long-term interest rates are staying persistently low, which is suggesting that, although you know, that they don't think they they think that the Fed is not going to keep on tightening and may well reverse course in the not too distant future. Um, so this sounds kind of like they have the same view that that people like me are expressing, which is that there's no cataclysm out there, but it's kind of you know we're building we're 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 sort of running out of of, of room for good news. The op-ed piece that we had by a senior administration official, the anonymous piece we had, made a point that I don't think too many people followed up on. Uh, he or she who wrote that piece said there are bright spots that the near ceaseless negative coverage of the administration fails to capture. Effective deregulation, uh, historic tax reform, a more robust military, and more. Would you agree that any of those are bright spots? I can't comment on the military. I don't really have a sense of that at all. Um, boy, that effective deregulation means stuff like letting more methane be emitted and more poison in the water. So it may be effective for corporate profits, but in terms of any kind of human cost-benefit analysis, it's really horrible. And look, that aside from the fact that I don't think we should have done that tax cut and the fact that it benefits people at the top, it's also a technical mess. I mean, the, the, this whole question of certain people get to classify their income as pass-through business income and not certain, and in fact, it's confusing enough that I'm not even sure about myself, which parts of my, you know, are, I, as a textbook author, am I, so this, it's, it's, cre it's a full employment act for, for accountants and lawyers. This is not what good, that's not effective tax reform. That's just creating even more loopholes in the system. And what about tariffs? We are now, as consumers, beginning to feel the effect of that. Yeah, and so, yeah, we have, uh, I mean, if all of the tariffs that Trump 
is, uh, you know, has announced uh, go into effect and, and ramp up to the 25% level that it's talking about now at, at next year, then we're talking about something like a, um, a $75 billion tax increase on America. You know, he keeps on talking as if it was a tax on foreigners, but it's not. It's a tax on us. Now, two-thirds of it is really taxes on business inputs, which will be passed through to consumers, but will also have the effect of reducing investment, reducing jobs, not increasing them. And the rest is now going to be directly on consumers. This is, it's not huge. You know, the U.S. economy is gigantic. So even if you're putting taxes on $300 billion worth of imports, it's still only a, a medium-sized policy, but it's not a good thing. And really what people are not, I think, capturing about this is the lawlessness of it. I mean, under U.S. law, the president does have the discretionary ability to impose tariffs. But there are certain criteria under which you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to do it for special cases like unfair foreign practices, but identified foreign practices, or national security, but identified national security. And Trump is just doing these things with barely a pretense at actually at an actual rationale. I mean, we're putting national security tariffs against imports from Canada. You know, come on. Uh, so what he's done is he's basically not only just disregarded the law, but he said to the rest of the world, agreements with the United States aren't worth the paper they're written on. You think you have a deal. You know, we have pledged that you have access to our markets. But if the president decides that he doesn't like you, then we'll, we'll just cut off your exports, you know, arbitrarily. This cannot be good for the America's future, and it would be very hard to undo that damage, even if somebody else eventually ends up in the White House. And you've also written that, contrary to what a lot of people say, including the Times on occasion, he is not a populist. No, I mean, if populism means anything, uh, it means actually doing some stuff for, you know, the regular working man regular working person, although I think in his case we mean, mean man, but anyway. Mm. Um, and nothing, the Trumpian agenda is, is, you know, is basically the usual elitist Republican agenda, uh, tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy, deregulation for corporations, uh, almost nothing for, for workers. The only thing you can say is, well, yeah, there's a lot of regular people out there who are racist, and I guess so, sort of Trump sort of gives voice to that point of view. But, but the economic agenda, I mean, let me put it this way. Some of us think we'd be in really bad shape if he were a true populist, because then he might have a lot more popular support than he does. But uh, uh, as it happens, there's been nothing actual. It's all, it's all in the gestures, not in the, in the reality. Paul Krugman, thanks for joining us. You can look for his columns in print on Tuesdays and Fridays and, of course, online all the time at nytimes.com. And coming up next, New York Times Our Land columnist Dan Barry. Welcome back. Joining me now, This Land columnist Dan Barry of the New York Times. For more than 10 years, he's explored the country with his extraordinary gift for detail, compassion, coupled with sly humor, and we've happily gone along for the ride. Now he's compiled the best of his columns for his latest book, This Land, America Lost and Found. It's just been published by Black Dog and Leventhal Publishers. Dan, what's been lost and what's been found? A uh, Good question. Um, I think it was uh, meant in a couple of ways. Um, most of the time I would fly into a, a larger city, say Omaha, but not stay in Omaha. I would drive another three or four hours to some place you had never heard of. And so it was kind of discovering communities you would argue might have been lost. And then also uh, the ten years that the book encompasses uh, begins with the end of the Bush era, uh, includes the entire Obama era, and then tips into the Trump era. And so uh, when the book was being published, there was a sense of like who we are as a nation. It seems awfully fractious times. And so that was what it was referring to as well, that maybe part of our identity or our sense of self is lost, but we might find them in these communities. Did you find that there is a New York exceptionalism, that people <clears throat> view New York differently? And when you go around the country, did you discover that, in fact, New York is different? You know, I, I don't know. I think what would often happen is I would wind up in a place like Hubbard, Nebraska, 
And there would be um, this disbelief that I was there. First, that, they, that I came all the way from New York and that they as a community thought they were worthy, which, which I had to dispel them of any kind of notion of condescension or anything like that. I think there was a <clears throat> preconceived notion of condescension, you know, the kind of East Coast elite thing, coupled with the fact that I was coming from the New York Times, which is, is a freighted term at times. Um, but I was able to dispel most people of it with my sly humor. Yes, indeed. I'm sure you did uh, with your winning ways. This started, in a way, in your own mind with Hurricane Katrina when you covered that. Why was that the impetus for it? At the time, I was writing the About New York column, and uh, Hurricane Katrina occurred, and I just felt a need to go and bear witness and be there. Uh, I felt out of the news, weirdly, even though I was in the best job in the at the paper, I thought, covering, you know, writing columns about New York. And uh, it just kind of opened my eyes to um, the possibility of other storytelling, to try and do the About New York column on a national scale as, as mad as that sounds. Um, there were things that I had never seen before, never experienced, and uh, it excited me. I mean, it was a very distressing and difficult time during Katrina, but I also spent time in, in, in New Orleans and along the Gulf Coast, and I said, I'd like to wander a little bit, and that's what happened. When you wander around the country, do you go with a story in mind, or do you just go to wander and find a story? Usually what I would do is try to identify a story, usually by looking at like the community briefs of a local newspaper. I wouldn't look at the Chicago Tribune, I'd look at the Peoria paper, and mm -hmm. then when I looked at the Peoria paper, I'd look at the the news items, the pancake breakfasts, or little items to see if there was something to tease out. Um, so that, that's, that's how I went about it, basically. You uh, separate the book by categories, change, hope, intolerance, the ever-present past. Uh, what about intolerance? Is intolerance <clears throat> growing, or <clears throat> somehow are we becoming more tolerant of each other? You know, I think uh, in light of Charlottesville and some of the, uh, the, the, the rise of the so-called alt-right, we have a sense that, oh, what is this thing called racism? What is this thing called intolerance? And the book demonstrates um, that this, this has gone on for a very, very long time, and it's a constant challenge for the country to grapple with it and overcome it. And so, for example, on the night that uh, Barack Obama became president, much of the country was in jubilation, yet in Springfield, Massachusetts, some people uh, were so upset by the prospect of a black president that they set fire to an African-American church in Springfield and burned it to the ground. And what I take away from that is how the pastor responded. Uh, you know, he mourned, he was upset, and he said, we're going to rebuild. And in fact, three years later, I returned and the church was built. The ever-present past, indeed. When you put all these columns together, what do you walk away with? What ties them together? You know, I, I think it is um, uh, that we think that we're, sometimes it looks as though we're, we're 50 different little entities. Um, and we tend to stereotype regions that are not our own. And uh, yet when you wander around the country, I see a great commonality. Uh, no matter how fractured we are as a nation at the time or how it seems, there's commonalities there that are kind of reassuring beyond the fact that there's always a, a TGIS or a Chili's next to a Hampton Inn off the interstate no matter mm -hmm. where you go. Um, the commonalities of, of, uh, of uh, caring for one another, uh, coming together if the, if the Mississippi overflows its banks, working together and um, and just really wanting to do better for our children. That's the, there are links that keep us together. And I think there's also, quite frankly, um, an unspoken pride in our country. I think, I think what I found was everyone was, was proud to be an American. Did you ever go back to the diner in Ohio where you spent some time before the presidential election? Oh, I did, yes. Yeah, sure. And were people disappointed, happy with their choices? Uh, the choices in, in voting. Um, no, I think I think it was kind of split in the in the diner at that time, and um, 
some people were upset um, that Obama won. That was in the 2012 election. Mm -hmm. um, and some were, were gratified. The, the problem is that uh, it was in Elyria, Ohio, a struggling city, and uh, Donna's Diner uh, is no more. Really? No. Uh, another sign of the times, I guess. Right. This is a wonderful book to read, and I highly commend it. Dan Barry, The New York Times, This Land, America's Lost and Found, has just been published by Black Dog and Leventhal. And look for Dan's other books, of course, too, his columns and articles in print and on nytimes.com. The week's lead issues up next on The Backstory. Welcome back. Accusations, denials, postponements, finger pointing, and that was only by Monday. Parts of the country deluged and hurting. President Trump's Supreme Court nominee's confirmation jeopardized, and a new race has begun here in New York for public advocate now that Letitia James may move on to statewide office. Joining me to discuss these stories and more, my New York Times colleagues, contributing writer Clyde Haberman, national political correspondent and CNN political analyst Alexander Burns, and City Hall Bureau reporter William Newman. It's that time in the election cycle again, so we're talking about former Mayor Bloomberg possibly running for president. What would be the timetable on that, Alex, and what would persuade him to run this time? Well, what he told me last week was that he had decided that if he ran, he would run as a Democrat and that he would... Well, he's it. run out of alternatives. He's run now. out of alternatives. And he actually has like a relatively good line on the stump when he's in front of the Democratic audiences saying, I, I know something about party politics. I've, I've been a member of all of them, right? And people kind of like that. Uh, um, uh, uh, right. No, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and, then he'll, and then he'll make up his mind after the midterm elections. Look, I think it's really, really hard to imagine him being a strong candidate for the Democratic nomination, but... You know, it's hard to sort of write off a guy with $40 billion to throw around. It's also why a lot of Democrats uh, don't sort of take his latest flirtation all that seriously because it costs him nothing uh, in the scheme of things to explore this again and have his fun with it and uh, eventually sometime next year decide, actually, I'm not going to do this. What's the fail-safe time and what are the vulnerabilities? I mean, when, on what basis does he decide, okay, this time I'm going to do it? Last time well, he did run because of... he thought he would hurt Hillary Clinton, she lost anyway. Uh, what does he decide on what basis this time? Well, there are some actuarial realities uh, that would suggest that this would be the, if he's going to do it, this is the time he's got to do it. Uh, he's 76 years old today. He'd be the oldest president ever inaugurated by nearly a decade. Uh, so if he were going to run, this may be the last chance for him uh, to do it. Um, but, you know, in terms of what his vulnerabilities are, uh, running as a Democrat, just in this one interview, his first extended comments about his possible campaign, he defended stop and frisk uh, just straight up and down. Uh, Democrats are a party that, you know, objected to stop and frisk when he was mayor, let alone now when the national conversation on policing has uh, moved so much. He was expressed some skepticism of the Me Too movement and uh, without me even bringing it up, sort of not quite defended Charlie Rose, but but questioned the veracity of the allegations against him. This is not a guy who's deeply in touch with the, the cultural sensibilities. Might have to of, defend uh, some of the hijinks at Salomon Brothers uh, back right. in the day. They'll, they'll drag, drag up a lot of that stuff, including whether or not he actually told a woman uh, to get an abortion who, who was there and was pregnant, and he said, kill it. Now, he denies he said it, but there are other people who say, yeah, actually, he did. Uh, Michael Bloomberg among, has many, many virtues, and I, I say that. Uh, quite quite seriously, but among them uh, is not a uh, a willingness to admit that maybe some of his positions were uh, not fully thought out. That he's still clinging to stop and frisk when it's been quite clear now for the five years of, of great decline in the use of that tactic, and our crime rate still stays very very low. That perhaps. There's not a, the correlation that Ray Kelly persuaded him uh, that there is between the two. I, I'm, nobody's saying, well, nobody uh, who's running for office in any sensible way is saying get rid of stop and frisk totally. But the numbers were out of control. It was nearly 700,000 at one point. It was on its way for a while until finally uh, uh, the protests kicked in. It was on its way to being 800,000 a year. Uh, it, it was 
totally out of control. But he's so data-driven that all he sees is the numbers. Although, if you look at the numbers, uh, the number of stops and frisks have gone down That's what I'm saying. enormously, yeah. and crime has That's not gone up, my, my as far as we can see. He with his data. He, yeah. he was you know, known for saying, let's look at the data when he was managing and was mayor. But in this case, he's actually ignoring the data. That is quite well, true. And, and in fairness to him, I did raise that with him in an interview, that you know, a lot of people predicted crime would rise if your successor did what he said he was going to do on policing. And he sort of acknowledged that uh, and gave de Blasio some credit for that uh, and then made this, you know, not terribly focused argument, but you can sort of see the underpinnings of what he would say in a campaign that, you know, making the case that essentially this rigid policy for a period of many years had changed the culture of the city in a way that took a lot of guns off the streets. And so, no, it didn't, crime didn't just uh, spring back up. I think that's going to be a tough sell uh, in, in a Democratic primary. But, you know, having said that, he is a guy who, if he's willing to risk electoral humiliation, can really run on his own terms in a way that no other potential candidate uh, can, that he can blanket Iowa and New Hampshire. He can go out and just sort of see how his message is received. And that's a lot of what the next seven weeks is going to be for him, is getting in front of Democratic audiences right. in places like Detroit, places like South Florida and Las Vegas, and just seeing, so what do these people think of me? And he could also raise issues uh, without a real risk uh, of you right. know, losing votes because... And Right. And he can also hand over a lot of money, which Democrats running in these midterm elections very happily take. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your gut tell you at this point? And, and also, again, when would he have to make a decision, uh, given the fact that he doesn't have to take a long time doing fundraising, too? Well, I, I, I could kind of argue it either way, that he could make up his mind pretty late in the process, see how many, you know, his path would be if a dozen very liberal candidates run and he can kind of run as the moderate. Uh, you know, he could take some time to let the field shape up. But, you know, he's also a guy who has a lot to prove uh, to a political party mm -hmm. that people generally don't let you just show up. Uh, so that's part of why he's getting as involved as he is in the midterm elections. And I do think he doesn't need to make a final decision on running for president until well into next year. But there are going to be things that he would have to do to sort of show that he's serious. I would say no, no later than January or February if he doesn't want people to assume this is just another fan dance. Willie, speaking of uh, January or February, if Letitia James uh, gets elected as attorney general, what is the mechanism to fill her seat? There's quite a contrast there between president and public advocate. <laughs> City, a job with all the power in the world and a job with none of it. Um, and why well, would anybody want it? <laughs> exactly. Well, Tish James President is Green. the public advocate. Uh, <laughs> if she wins uh, to become attorney general, it seems likely, um, then there would be a snap election to fill that job uh, within about 45 days of January 1st, so late February probably. And just about everybody in New York City politics wants to run for the job for a couple of reasons. One, Just give me one reason. It's, it's a stepping stone to be mayor. <laughs> okay, that's a good enough reason. <laughs> Thanks to Clyde Haberman, Alexander Burns, and William Newman for joining me. And coming up next, Coda. A century ago, in the grim aftermath of the Great War, the British adventure novelist P.C. Wren borrowed a phrase from the French for the title of his book about the Foreign Legion. Wren's hero, Michael Geste, was nicknamed Beau, and the book titled Beau Geste popularized the French phrase. Literally, it means a beautiful, noble, generous gesture. Grace, under pressure or not, is a rarity in public life these days. I was reminded of that by the debate over the naming of the new Tappan Zee Bridge. Some people who lived nearby want to keep the old name. Perhaps they've forgotten that their predecessors fought against the bridge in the first place. They blocked it in 1936. They were defeated in 1950 when Governor Dewey and Robert Moses overrode the Not In My Backyard backlash. Dewey and Moses wanted the new state thruway to bypass New Jersey and lead directly to New York City. But why did they build the bridge in the worst place possible? The very name Tappan Zee is an Indian and Dutch coupling, loosely translated as large body of cold water. It's where the river is widest. But the site also happens to be 800 feet north of the 25-mile radius that defines 
the jurisdiction of the Port Authority, which meant that the newly minted Thruway Authority could keep all the bridge tolls for itself. Several names were rejected, including the George Clinton Bridge after New York's first governor. Tappan Zee stuck for four decades until Mario Cuomo graciously agreed to name the bridge for Malcolm Wilson, a Republican from Westchester and one of his predecessors in the invisible role of lieutenant governor. After spending 15 years waiting for Nelson Rockefeller to retire, Wilson served one year as governor before losing an election for the job he coveted. The next 25 years proved to be just as invisible as the name of a bridge. Now the old bridge has been demolished. It's arguable whether naming the new one after Mario Cuomo is the most fitting way for Andrew Cuomo to honor his father. Even though, like the bridge, Mario Cuomo connected New York to the rest of America. Given the brief and awkward bromance between Andrew Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio this week, though, here's a tangible suggestion to demonstrate their newfound democratic unity. Hudson River Park on Manhattan's west side sprouted from a pact between Andrew's father and Mayor David Dinkins. Imagine if de Blasio agreed to name the park for Mario Cuomo. Now that would be a beau geste. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.